may, uh, there is good translation. I, I thank the translators, they have done a wonderful job for me. Everything was, uh, was beautiful. Um, so I will try to go quickly, because I think we will be kicked out at 10 o'clock. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So I will try to uh, stick to my text. If, if you see I am diverging too much, you, you uh, please tell me. So, um, the aesthetics of transition is uh, something that is interesting for me now because um, we, uh, as we have these new devices that are multiplying, the problem of, uh, of uh, going from one to the other is, is a really interesting aesthetical question. So this is why I decided to uh, bring it to you tonight. Uh, but before starting, I would like to try to um, uh, suggest that uh, in 10 years, we will not talk about artificial reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. This is a hope, at least I have. Uh, because I'm really uh, uh, a big fan of William James, who wrote a beautiful book in 1908 called The, um, the Treaty of Radical Empiri Empiricism, where he basically says that reality is everything that can be experienced. So uh, to me, these new uh, flavors of reality are just a way to, for, to uh, label, in fact, uh, experiences that appear to be novel, but as we will assimilate them, they will just become reality, uh, very simply reality. So, um, if, uh, I'm not proposing a new model, but uh, for me, instead of talking about virtual reality, uh, hybrid reality, uh, diminished reality, which is, was coined by um, um, Steve Mann, uh, I prefer to talk about the, the, a model that is inspired by Gilles Deleuze in his book, Le Pli, Basically, the reality is like a, a fabric, a continuous fabric that is folded. So basically, the, our challenge as artists, as, uh, as uh, 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 observers of uh, avant-garde uh, uh, art practice, is to understand the folds and how we, we transit from one fold to the other. Uh, this is a, a very short uh, uh, exercise I, tr I made to try to understand what we're dealing with when we talk about immersion. So it starts in the brain, you know, the virtual. Uh, I know, Derek, you talk about the physical, the virtual, and, uh, and, and the mental. But I, I tend to associate, for my own purpose, mental and virtual. Because, in fact, when we project something out to the world, it's, it comes from a, a concept that we've developed. But it's just a formalization of that concept. For me, I connect the two. So, we start in, in physical immersion. When we are born, we're immersed in the world. Uh, and then uh, we, um, when we start to project outside the cave of Lascaux or a painting or video or whatever, we create a window onto uh, something that is uh, immaterial. But then, uh, this is the case of my generation, with uh, not only me, but uh, 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 trying to expand the screen to make it immersive, like here, actually. We are in a kind of uh, immersive space here, uh, to, uh, to, to experience what it is to be immersed in your own ideas. But as soon as we do that, we're isolated, again, from the physical. So we need to create a window into the physical. And eventually, we need to find a way to aggregate, integrate this whole thing into a unified experience. So this is what I will be. Uh, trying to describe. So, as Yves Klein uh, uh, did in, um, in 1960, he said, I'm, my medium is space, therefore I'm going there. So, we simulate a, a jump to the window. So, I propose to follow him in that uh, jump into the void. Uh, immersion is well uh, acquired right now, but in fact, to understand uh, uh, that it's an invention and it had to be uh, understood, you know, uh, experientially, we have to go back to the uh, English garden of the 18th century. The garden actually was an interesting um, learning experience. They crafted the gardens in a way to, as examples of how to understand space in a new way and how to understand somebody's position in space. So the garden was probably one of the, of the inspiration for 
uh, this, this invention of immersion which happened in the 18th century. The interesting thing also is that in the typical English garden you have the Temple of Venus, which was a, a feature that you found because we also say that the 18th century was the century of women, uh, because this is where women started to have more influence on society. They, they curated uh, a culture by inviting people in their salon in London and Paris and probably Milan too. And so with this, they could basically uh, indirectly influence the affair of the world. But they did more than that. They influenced the affair of the world in, in, in um, uh, passing on the idea that uh, the, the way we did science at the time, the rash, very rationalist way to do science, was not enough to describe the, the world. Uh, we needed emotion, uh, uh, sentiment, and therefore they basically created the, a, 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 a sort of feminization of science, which leads to all kinds of very interesting things. This is a quadratura. This is a, a fantastic idea to, to inhabit a space with, uh, with a, a created environment, uh, this is more than a garden, it's arch architecture, garden, mythology, and everything. Uh, and it's not as radical as this drawing, for example, which is from 1867, which was um, created by uh, a ge geologist in Geneva who was um, um, studying the mountains around Geneva. And basically, he went on this, the summit of this mountain and invented a way to describe in a single drawing what he saw. And I, I'm really referring to this drawing as, as something like the invention of the horizon because that was a very clear expression uh, of what it means to, uh, be in, to, to feel you are in the center of something. And I was wondering why did, did we come up with such an idea at this moment in history. It's probably because um, uh, we needed to formalize uh, the position that we happen to, to, to experience in the world, a kind of, uh, I call it the nest for the sensitive subject, uh, sensible subject. And, but this was such a powerful idea uh, that uh, the whole 19th century was, was uh, very uh, 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 full of examples of panorama. It started with Barker in London, but it, it, it grew through Europe, uh, Germany, France, uh, and, uh, and Italy and Switzerland, uh, up to the point where the, you know, at the Paris Expo in, in uh, 1900, uh, the, uh, the, the, the cinematograph was put to use to create the illusion of rising above Paris in a balloon. But the technique was not quite there yet, uh, electricity, uh, projection technique, uh, uh, sharpness uh, of, of images, uh, it's very difficult to project in, in a spherical space, so it was uh, uh, not operated. Uh, uh, it's, it apparently, it closed after three days only, and very few people saw this. I happened to see this, Expo 67 in Montreal when I was 14, a film, cinematographic panorama, and I thought this will be part of my generation, you know, the idea that we will not be uh, necessarily uh, telling stories, in a frame screen, but being immersed in, in experience. Uh, meanwhile, cinema caught on. Uh, we know cinema is the, the great uh, industry of the 20th century. They tried to expand the, the, the size of the, frame, the, the screens. Uh, with IMAX, the people who had developed this panoramic cinema also were the um, developers of IMAX and Omnimax Theater. But now we have uh, the screens are, have, have tried to be as big as possible, but also as small as possible with the new watch. And, um, and now that they were, the, they were deciding that it would be better to make bigger phones, which are now used for head-mounted display. And so they invented something, or they, they, dev, they did uh, technical development uh, that was used for something completely different than what they expected, meaning like to uh, with these special optical systems to uh, immerse people in a um, uh, in virtual reality. So uh, this is interesting. This camera uh, was shown uh, just a couple of weeks ago in Montreal and the symp in symposium called IX, and it basically is dev uh, creates a spherical stereo image that you can see from a helmet. So because the camera is high, you see the person wearing the the mask is looking down because she sees everybody from above. So it's a very interesting experience that Derek tried it also, and he can uh, testify that, uh, that it's quite uh, uncanny. 
Uh, this is also, uh, some of you may have seen that, but it's a combination of, um, it's a flight simulator, basically. Uh, you have a small ventilator blowing wind in your face, you wear this helmet, you, your movements are uh, transported by this uh, mechanical machine, and uh, it is it tr unbelievably credible. Uh, you think you are a bird flying over uh, a city, and that's uh, a proof that, uh, that it can, you can really trick the body into thinking that you are somewhere else. But at the same time, why not go for simpler devices? We were just thinking maybe if we just use this very uh, classic uh, bubble chair uh, and, and add a screen, you can turn around and have the experience of immersion in a more comfortable way. This is our dome in Montreal at the Society for Arts and Technology that we use to uh, create uh, art, artworks. Uh, this is one example of data visualization for a group of uh, 150 people. And uh, one project to give you an example of what we can do there, like real-time uh, uh, immersive graphics, this time based on a work by uh, Marshall McLuhan. Uh, the medium is the massage. Uh, we took the book and we deployed it in a 3D space. Um, okay, so I'm finished with this section. And I think if all goes well, yeah. Uh, uh, Buckminster Fuller is an inspiration. Why would we immerse ourselves in that in, 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 uh, in such large spaces? One possibility is to be exposed to uh, data visualization. You can multiply screen, but you can literally immerse yourself in larger spaces. So that's one of the, of the ways. So what we've seen until now is basically the past of immersion. How did we invented the idea to, to be uh, surrounded by sound images, to be inside the medium rather than outside looking at it. Uh, but the problem that we face now is, is a very interesting one, is how do we go, if we have this multifold reality model, how do we go from, uh, from one fold to the other, from the physical space to the virtual space, uh, and uh, I'm going to show you like three examples uh, or, or three types of uh, transition that, uh, that could be interesting. One, uh, to follow with Buckminster Fuller, one is, he calls this a, a, a private sky. So this is not a very uh, 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 complex technique, but if you are inside a dome, uh, the dome is sort of filters your view to the environment, so it, it sort of creates a grid from which you can interpret the space you're in. So it helps you understand the larger space. First thing you do is very simple. You can, you can basically play with light to bend, bend light or transform the, the way that the space uh, is reflected. I'm not a big fan of Jeff Koons, but when I saw his retrospective at uh, Whitney, I, I took a lot of pleasure in watching through his uh, balloon dugs, the people around in the environment. So the dugs became a kind of looking device, uh, 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 yeah, a device to observe what was around. Uh, this is a, a picture of like the beauty that you find in, in just like very simple reflection using glass. Uh, uh, and if you start playing with that, you can get with very interesting uh, concept of uh, urban art, for example, that would be uh, uh, using uh, a, a hidden sources to make like floating things appear. But um, we, are, we have many examples of like augment, what we call augmented reality, the, the augmented fold of reality, I would say. Here we are uh, trying to, uh, uh, to show how the, the uh, archaeological uh, foundation of the old city in Montreal can be, rec uh, how we can recreate the building that don't exist anymore uh, using the tablets. Uh, this is another one which basically uses uh, uh, markers, fire hydrants, to uh, put information in the city and create a, n a narrative in the city. But of course, we dream of these glasses that will be able, to, where you'll be able to mix the amount of physical and virtual uh, world, uh, spaces um, uh, without uh, you know, blocking the view like we do now with the um, head-mounted display. Another strategy to, to, for transition uh, is basically walking in and out, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, this is a hotel in, uh, in, um, in London where basically they greet you uh, in, a, in a very fun way. Like doors is a very interesting device, actually, walking in and out of rooms or buildings. But uh, again, back to uh, the, uh, the English garden, 
uh, the temple of Venus uh, in this garden had a kind of um, uh, 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 cave. How do you say that? A cave, yeah, kind of cave, that was restored, and uh, it was very well known that it was. They called it the. the uh, they associated that with with, with the. Um, the the doorway to into life, you know, that's that's where you 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 get born. So, uh, I this is why I took an old uh, video that I did uh, a long time ago of a performance where I basically simulate my own birth <laughs> with a kind of suit that was designed to protect uh, my body from light. So, but uh, it's interesting to see how this uh, this this is a way of uh, in a way to. Uh, to explore the idea of entering and exiting a, a space. But I, I made, uh, shortly after, a larger space, a more generous space, that was uh, one of the first projection dome that I wanted to experiment with. But it turned out that uh, the, uh, in, uh, 40 years ago, it was difficult to do video mapping. So uh, the project that I turned out, uh, ended up doing was this uh, panorama where basically you could uh, create a conversation with these virtual characters that would uh, take you around in the landscape. But entering this thing was, was quite interesting. It was just a cloth hanging from uh, the ceiling uh, very loosely, so a bit of wind would move, move them. But when you entered the space, there was uh, quite a nice uh, uh, sound environment, and you really felt enclosed. So I fell in love with with, uh, with the, the idea of immersion at the time, and then uh, went on to in, develop all kinds of devices. This one is kind of funny. Uh, it, it uses a system where basically you, you pull the, uh, the screen, uh, which is hanging from the ceiling, uh, over your head, and you are suddenly exposed to uh, the, uh, the video. Uh, other uh, strategies, uh, for example, uh, like this one, which is a later version of the same system uh, to make it bigger. Basically, you enter, close the door, close the half screen, and then you are enclosed in that space. Uh, again, these are, I'm showing that just because they are interesting examples of how we can think about entering and exiting um, uh, devices to, that puts us in immersion. Uh, this one, the, well, this is the Oculus here, uh, and uh, what we were uh, discussing with Scott Fisher recently uh, of California, how they were discussing uh, in length whether it was, it was better to have a device that you strap on your head or something that you just uh, hold with your hand and that can be passed around more easily. And that's where we are right now. This, these new uh, uh, apparatus are appearing, they're very appealing, they are, um, they, they, they are, we certainly need to uh, learn to work with them, but we don't know yet exactly uh, how to uh, handle these. Um, other kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, transitions, uh, for example, this is an example of uh, the recording uh, that I make. Uh, on different beaches and how they end up looking in the device. So basically, it's the transposition of a physical space in a virtual space. And, uh, and with the sound, uh, it, it's really uh, interesting to see, uh, to compare the two uh, experiences uh, of being in the, in the real beach or the virtual beach. Also, uh, one of the ways to um, uh, transform your experience is to move around the space. Of course, if you are immersed, it's natural to be uh, able to interact with the space in which you are. So these were the early devices, but we've, um, uh, we've developed them into uh, more sophisticated uh, and cheaper uh, devices, uh, which were used here. It's a project in Toronto, where uh, basically the screen is a bit uh, smaller. You enter from the base. And, uh, and then um, you can exit the space, either uh, jumping through the window like uh, Yves Klein did, except you're in the virtual 68th floor of a building, or you can go the other way inside the, um, the, the, the art collection of the Bank of Montreal, which was the, 
com which commissioned the project. But by doing so, you sort of disconnect the, the physical target on the floor and the virtual target in the world. So that's you, your, um, you, you exercise this freedom of uh, detaching yourself from the physical to enter the virtual space. But the virtual space is modeled on the physical, but it offers opportunities that you could not have in the, in the physical. For example, by going through um, each painting and discovering an, uh, the artist and uh, the process by which he produced uh, the, the work. How am I doing with time? Um, Maria Grazia, is it okay? Okay, so... Uh, Three minutes. Okay. Uh, so the, um, it's very important that these, space, these virtual spaces that we create are not, or, uh, are not, uh, uh, are inhabited. So this is this bring me uh, to, uh, I will jump that to uh, the software that we've developed at the Society for Arts and Technology. Uh, we have two kinds of software: one that aggregates physical spaces with one another to create a shared. Uh, space a bit like you do with Skype or FaceTime, uh, except that uh, you have the choice of peripherals. You can choose your cameras, your projectors, your you can do a scenography. And we have used that very successfully in theater, for example. Uh, and this is an example of a, of a performance called The God is a DJ that was performed between an audience in Montreal and an audience in Geneva with the actors playing on, on two symmetrical stages. And uh, this is just an example of the fantastic potential of uh, scenographers and artists and uh, uh, writers that would want to embrace this uh, idea of uh, aggregating, creating a new performance space by connecting you know, theaters together, like this room with another room. The other uh, line that we have uh, is uh, to create these collaborative virtual spaces. Basically, it's, it would be like creating the, um, the new phone booth, you know, uh, uh, where basically the, uh, you, w the, the, the device, that you, the apparatus you enter, teleports you into a shared virtual space. This is an example of an early, early prototype where we used uh, uh, regular video cameras to uh, record somebody from four uh, points of views. But the idea is that every participant is, occupies a space and moves around that space and is seen in the space that they occupy by the others. Uh, we are trying to developing, develop that to um, come to uh, a more convincing uh, representation because the idea is that is to be in that space uh, with, uh, with your own body and to restore the the uh, uh, body language that we have developed in the physical space. And now I, I absolutely want to show you my finale. Uh, and so beauty in the sublime. So what, why would we do all this? I think the, uh, the real project is to uh, basically uh, re-enchant the world, rediscover, uh, reinvent the, the, the modernist project. Uh, I went back to the mountain where um, uh, de Saussure did his original drawing to take a photograph and match it, and it was uh, spectacularly accurate, uh, uh, the drawing they made. Uh, so uh, this was a, a time when uh, uh, they were thinking about uh, the idea of beauty and the sublime and basically um, trying to inject a bit of humanity and sensitivity in, in art and science. Uh, we should use, we should re-enchant the world, not uh, because uh, we have to deconstruct the project of going to live on Mars. It would not make sense to do that. What we should do instead is, is, is turn the Earth into a garden, uh, and uh, and to work with the time zones. Now that we can communicate instantly with anywhere on the planet, uh, the time, the sun becomes a very important uh, element because. Uh, if we are in uh, our time zone, for example, in uh, the east of North America, uh, Quebec, uh, and the west part of South America, we, we wake up at the same time in the morning. So if we want to create an event, a live event, we are uh, uh, equal. And we speak four languages, the French, English, Mexican, uh, I mean Spanish, and Portuguese. Uh, 
so, but every time zone has its own uh, uh, characteristic, and our new neighborhood is the time zone. Of course, there are uh, also aspects of going east and west. The more east and west you go, the more uh, asynchronous you are, but that might be an advantage in some circumstances, so we should work with that. And this is my last slide. And uh, the idea here is that if we turn the Earth into a garden again, keeping the possibility to connect instantly with everywhere, we, we, um, in this new uh, paradigm, uh, I think it will not be a sin to accept wisdom from women. So thank you very much.